So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You're all extremely welcome to the Institute, and a special welcome to our, our speaker, uh, Pedro Serrano, who's the Deputy Secretary General for CSDP and Crisis Response uh, in the European External Action Service. Uh, before we actually go into the main part of our, uh, our um, talk, perhaps I could just ask if people would turn off their mobile phones so that we don't have uh, ringing interrupting our talk. And also just to say that um, the talk, the address will be on the record and uh, Pedro, if you don't mind taking questions afterwards, they will of course be off the record, Chatham House rules, no identification of the um, location or individuals, uh, either you or anybody else uh, making a comment. Uh, so, as I say, you're most welcome, um, Pedro. Um, you have, uh, you're coming at a very interesting time for us here, both in the overall uh, EU um, uh, uh, scenario, but also in particular in the area that you're looking after. Uh, just to go over um, uh, Pedro's background, he is a Spanish diplomat. I was going to say was, but you'll never leave. No, no, I'm still Spanish diplomat. diplomat. I have my diplomatic yeah. passport here right. in Spanish. <laughs> yes, yes. You won't give that up. Easily. No. <laughs> no. Uh, and um, before he entered the European Union service in 2003, uh, he served in Cuba, Frankfurt, Tanzania, Brussels. That's a uh, a good range. And then in 2003, um, Pedro uh, entered the cabinet of his fellow countryman, Javier Solana, uh, who uh, had a huge influence in this area of, of foreign policy. Um, prior to becoming uh, a Deputy Secretary General of the EEAS in 2015, uh, he was Managing Director for Crisis Response uh, Operational Coordination. And he also previously served as Principal Advisor on External Affairs to former president of the European Council, Herman von Rompuy, and also was, um, uh, interestingly, the first to head the EU delegation in New York after the Lisbon Treaty, which of course changed the uh, representation in EU missions abroad. So as I say, um, you're coming at a very interesting time for us because um, uh, there's been a lot of activity in this area of CSDP. Uh, since the launch of the EU Global Strategy in 2016, and then the High Representative pre presented um, an ambitious implementation plan, uh, and there's been um, a number of initiatives launched to deepen defence uh, uh, coordination, per PESCO, with which I think we're very familiar, and uh, even in Ireland we're quite familiar with PESCO, and that's been given a, a big jump forward in, with the recent uh, Council. And decisions to increase the number of, um, of um, projects to 34. Then there's the coordinated annual review, the European Defence Fund, uh, military planning and conduct uh, capability. Uh, all of these are designed to enhance um, the EU's capacity to respond. Uh, so considerable activity, more so as the High Representative says, I think in the last two years rather than in the previous 10. But also, I think, um, mm -hmm. uh, the civilian uh, uh, area did need, I think, a significant boost. It's been sort of the Cinderella of the CSDP, because uh, while the military missions uh, attract more visibility, particularly ones like Atalanta and Sofia, uh, the, the significant work by the existing 10 and uh, some 22 altogether has not been fully appreciated. So the Defence and uh, Foreign Affairs Council on the 19th of November, 19th and 20th, produced a very significant document in terms of um, civilian CSDP con compact uh, with 22 political commitments uh, to reinforce the EU in, in this mm. regard and to make it more capable, more effective, more responsive, I suppose you could say. So um, uh, with all the activities and all that is taking place at the moment, um, Pedro, I give you the floor to explain uh, where we are and in particular where we're going. Yeah. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. A real pleasure to, to be here with all of you this afternoon. And um, Would you prefer to sit here? Or, or take no, no. I, 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 if it's okay, I'd prefer to yes, sit here. Right. I think yes. it makes it more cosy and, uh, and more convivial, yes. I think. Yes, okay. Um, so a real pleasure. Um, I think it's a good moment um, yeah. to come at the end of the year. End of the year is always a moment for reflection and what has happened. 
not only the end of the year, it's also the ending of the commission mandate, uh, where we have elections uh, uh, next year. The whole leadership of the European Union will uh, be uh, renewed. Also momentous for the European Union because one of our member states will be leaving. First time uh, a member state leaves uh, the European Union. And it's not just any member state. It's the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So uh, yes, quite a, quite a, a country. Um, so all this really pushes, I think, all of us um, um, earlier into the uh, festive mood of reflections and what is happening, where are we going, what have we done. And I'd like to share some, some views uh, with you. And you were mentioning, Mary, the great progress in, uh, you didn't say great, but uh, so I, I add the great progress yes, yes, yes. in terms of, of security and defense policy in the last um, uh, three years after the presentation of the global strategy by the high representative progress in many fields in developing of defense capabilities in our crisis management structures in partnerships with others and in our own uh, operation. But why did this progress happen and where are we? It happened because Europeans felt threatened. Because we decided and thought that we could not continue just going on with uh, what we were doing in order to protect our security interests, to promote our interests uh, uh, internationally and to protect our citizens within the European Union. And this has triggered a certain um, political will to move forward and to explore things that we had not been exploring uh, before. And I think you know very well what were the main circumstances uh, behind this, uh, be it uh, the situation uh, to the east of Europe, and notably starting in 2000, well, not starting, it would, it's been a... <laughs> A drift, but uh, in 2014, a major um, change in Europe with uh, Ukraine being invaded by uh, Russia, with um, Crimea um, annexed by uh, Russia. So, um, a more aggressive Russia that has been uh, developing to the east, also threatening Moldova with the situation in Georgia that you're aware. Uh, and uh, the situation in the Western Balkans, which is not as smooth sailing as we all had hoped for. So that's the situation uh, to, uh, let's say, the East and, and Central Europe. Middle East, well, we have a, a crisis of uh, major proportions. We have a real regional conflict and a need for a real regional um, solution and, and a concert. Uh, and that was the situation that uh, came about after the 2011 events that we all very optimistically termed uh, Arab Spring, but that have developed into very different uh, situations and notably have um, developed into a major crisis in Syria and Iraq with real warfare, with more than 300,000 people killed in, in seven years of war in, uh, in Syria, and a major conflict between uh, in the region. Um, with all the protagonists in the region, uh, really, although we have not been fully treating it uh, as such. We've been treating the situation in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, but this all there are connections and there's a major power uh, game uh, or strife in, in, in that uh, region. And then you go to the south, Libya, of course, part of the 2011 uh, upheaval, um, a situation that is still very unstable, that is destabilizing uh, neighbors, uh, and just uh, at, the, at the coasts of, of Europe, obviously, destabilizing the Sahel as well, which is a very uh, part and very poor uh, region. Now, this was the situation more or less as um, it was when we started all these major reforms. And if you look back and you say, is the situation better now? I think the answer is clearly no. Um, all these risks, have, some of them have evolved. In Syria, okay, we're maybe coming to the end of a war, but we still have a major regional conflict. The uh, terrorist unleashed uh, in, in the course of that uh, new conflict, which has given rise to a new brand of terrorist, Daesh, uh, is there and it's morphing and, and developing and spreading into, into other parts of the world. Uh, so from that perspective, certainly things are not better. And Russia, well, we just have to look at the incidents um, uh, this uh, weekend uh, over the, uh, as of, or rather last weekend, or, or last week, of the Azov uh, Sea, and, and, and the situation that certainly is, 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 is not improving either. So um, 
In addition, I would add maybe in the last three years, we have gained even more consciousness that um, in addition to these conflicts that surround Europe, and Europe is really, I won't say targeted, but is really very much threatened, we have a major um, strategic environment that has become even more volatile and, and dangerous. And here, we've discussed Russia as one of the major strategic actors, which is becoming also more active in other theaters. It has become very active, was very active, has, has been very active in Syria, and part of that is including becoming more active uh, in, in the Western Balkans, is becoming uh, active in, uh, in some parts of Africa. So we have a new attitude on, on the Russian uh, side. We also have uh, China, which probably, if, if anyone would ask probably any one of us what is one of the major challenges of this century and the coming years is where will China go and how it will establish itself as an international actor. And in China, I think there's one very interesting development, um, as you know, in the 16th century or 15th century, um, the Chinese emperor decided to destroy uh, Chinese fleet. They had huge fleets. They were moving um, and, 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 and traveling to uh, all the uh, East African uh, coast. And there was a conscious decision of the emperor to say, no, we have to concentrate security and stability within China. No more adventures. And what is happening now Part of the phenomenon that we see, and maybe it's just, a, let's say, um, um, one of these, Baudel uh, um, um, used to say that they are, that he didn't care for, for, for events, he cared about big trends. But there are events that illustrate big trends. And, and I think one of the events or, or developments that illustrates this broader trend of where China is going is its maritime uh, position and uh, the attitude it is having around the uh, China Sea's, um, um, what would I call it, difference or uh, uh, discussions about uh, um, sovereignty in the China Seas. So we see China, again, as an actor, very powerful, one of the biggest, the biggest country in the world, 1.3 billion people, biggest uh, economy after the US and, and the EU's collectively. Um, and with the most potential, becoming a military, uh, strong military actor and acting with great, greater assertiveness abroad, including in Africa and, uh, and certainly in its own uh, region. So probably uh, handling and dealing and, and understanding better China and where it's going will be one of the big challenges. And all this adds to the situation surrounding Europe. Then we have the United States, of course, the, the other uh, big country which um, has been, while it, we remain uh, strong partners, and I think there's no doubt about that, uh, nevertheless, the United States has been giving very clear messages uh, around its America First uh, policy that, to a certain extent, unsettle, uh, if not uh, situations, certainly consciences. Um, and, and it is creating uh, uncertainty on the partnership. Uh, and the nature of the partnership and the evolution of the partnership uh, with uh, the United States. So this is the panorama that we're in, I think, at the end, uh, roughly, I uh, uh, schematized, uh, at the end of, of this year, 2018. Have we done enough to address uh, these challenges? I think the answer is, is clearly no. Is there much more that needs to be done? I think yes, uh, there's no doubt about this. But for this, we need clarity uh, on, on what are the, uh, the challenges that we're facing, of what is it that we can do within the European Union framework and, and nationally, and then we need determination and unity in pursuing uh, this. And I think that's, that's really uh, the, the big challenge for the European Union. Can we muster uh, that uh, determination and, and unity, and will we have the same understanding of the challenges that, surrounding, that surround us, which I have described probably very clumsily and, and very superficially, but I think those are, um, those are the ones. Now, so here's where we are. I would add another element, which is how are these security challenges affecting uh, the, European, uh, the European Union member states and the European Union as such? And here, they're affecting it in different ways. This is not about territorial 
uh, immediate territorial threats to the European Union or its member states. But we see uh, organized crime responsible, for example, for traffic of migrants and irregular flows of migrants. We see broader organized crime uh, threats, including in, in trafficking of weapons and drugs, no doubt, that we have to face. We see terrorism, again, the new brand of terrorism that has surfaced, um, that uh, is uh, more difficult to handle as well, because they are using um, uh, the, the, the media, the, uh, all the possibilities of, of an interconnected uh, world. And because you don't need a lot of organization to produce um, damage, uh, nor means. You can, you can just um, stabbing, uh, and a stabbing incident will be enough to trigger what terrorism is about, because terrorism at the end is about creating social fear. And, and this is what, is what is happening. And you can do that with very little uh, effort. Um, and then we have uh, cyber and hybrid uh, challenges, I think, and cyber. Uh, very clear um, to uh, to all, and 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 these uh, it's you can you may need military uh, means, but you may need many other type of, of means in order to address uh, cyber threats. You have disinformation, uh, which is part of hybrid and and cyber as well. So you have new new threats that are um, um, confronting the member states of the European Union and the European Union as such. And here is where we see that you do need for this a mixture of, of elements. If you want to protect yourself and if you want to build your security and defense, this is not only about building defense, it is about building defense, but not only about building defense, you need to look at a much broader picture. When you're uh, trying to address instability in the Sahel, because ultimately it will hit us, it's also about development and governance in the Sahel. If you want to ensure that, uh, um, that we are protecting our societies, you need to be able to combat uh, cyber attacks and disinformation. And again, this is not necessarily uh, military means. And you do need to link up between your internal um, security instruments and your external security instruments so that we are aware uh, there's an exchange of information and we are aware of what's coming in from the outside and what should we be looking at in the, uh, at the, in the outside in order to avoid it coming in. So we are, um, in all the efforts that we've been doing in the European Union in this last uh, uh, years, this dimension of, of the comprehensive nature of, uh, of the threats and the need to have a much more sophisticated and wide array of tools, civilian military, to, to simplify, uh, has been one of the driving elements and the need to ensure that your internal and external, external instruments are interlinked also very much uh, a very important part of how we are uh, operating. And one last point before I enter into the le vif du sujet, uh, the, the need to try to be, um, to act preventatively mm. and to look into, um, into crises before they occur. And here as well, during this last years, the European Union has been looking into its analysis uh, instruments it's situational awareness instruments in order to be able to identify earlier, and we have developed different uh, methods, I'm happy to explain afterwards, in order to have better foresight about what are the challenges that lie ahead, maybe in the three or four year um, um, horizon, but also challenges that may be only three or four or five weeks away, and, and that may hit um, and, and affect our interests, and we've been fine-tuning our tools there as well. Um, so this is the complex nature of, of the threats we're facing, the broad approach, which requires to be an integrated approach, which needs to link up the internal with the external aspects, and the need to think as preventatively as, as we can in, in carrying out all this. In terms of our uh, security and defense instruments, we have advanced essentially along uh, three main tracks. First track has been the development, um, uh, uh, the co in enhanced cooperation in developing defense capabilities. And why is this necessary? Because we have a very atomized uh, defense industry. Uh, technology will not be able to uh, keep up and we will lose industry, we will lose, lose technological know-how unless we go towards greater consolidation and, and, biggest, bigger, and bigger efforts in, in producing uh, jointly. And this has been very much behind um, uh, the proposals that, the that uh, both uh, the High Representative and the Commission have been putting 
on the table. Of course, it also contributes to greater interoperability, which ultimately will help us uh, also not only develop together defense capabilities, but develop but deploying them together in a more effective uh, manner. And there are four major initiatives um, that uh, were developed, and amazingly so, I think they were all more or less developed independently, and but they all fit together wonderfully well. And uh, since we're um, great bureaucrats, uh, we uh, exercise ourselves now in creating coherence between all these uh, and developing mechanisms that will help us uh, enhance uh, the coherence between these mechanisms. And there, you, I think you referred to a few of them, permanent structured cooperation, it's the European Defence Fund. It is the Coordinated Annual Review on Defence. And uh, I would say, above all of them, is the inspiring uh, document. What is it that we need to produce? And this is the Capability Development Plan, the military requirements that we identify in common. And we have made uh, the, the last iteration. This is an old uh, mechanism. But the last iteration has been quite revolutionary uh, um, um, because it has gone more into um, not only into the needs that uh, the European Union might require for its uh, little crisis management operations, which are relatively unimportant, but needs of member states and their own national defense needs and needs, collective needs such as the ones that can be generated within NATO. So our, our CDP, our Capability Development Plan, is fully compatible uh, with the NATO defense planning process, the NDPP, and therefore a much more useful uh, tool. And at the same time, and differently to the NATO uh, defense planning process, um, the CDP has been developed with a view to facilitating and encouraging and promoting cooperation amongst member states in developing defense capabilities. So it's quite a sophisticated uh, instrument and, and an important progress uh, that was made there. So this is the heart. And, and the CDP has to um, feed PESCO projects, but also uh, projects that would be financed um, through Commission uh, financial instruments. And here we, we have right now already the European um, uh, Defence Industrial uh, Development Programme, uh, the EDIDP, which is the precursor to the broader European Defence Fund that will hopefully be uh, adopted and established um, starting in, in 2021 until 2027. And which is aimed with a proposal that was it was suggested 13 billion, uh, 13 billion um, euros um, for the period 2021-2027 uh, that should um, be able to finance projects uh, um, on research for defence development, and these will be financed 100%. But also projects uh, for development of defence capability up to the level of. Um, of um, uh, prototype, and these will only be financed up to 20% with the 10% bonus if they're also PESCO projects, so 30% if it's uh, PESCO, which means you have a multiplying effect that the Commission multiplies by five, well, it could be multiplied by actually even more because if it's only up to the level of prototype, and then you'll have to produce the thing. So if you, if you really take all that into account, it could be quite a boost in, in terms of defense capability development for the European Union. And to support these processes, both the CDP and the, and the, the projects, we have developed the Coordinate Annual Review on Defense, which forces member states to explain on an annual basis what is it that their, what their national, plan, the national defense plans are about, and to see whether they are moving towards meeting uh, the, uh, the gaps that we've identified in common, and whether we, I, we can identify, through comparing different national defense plans, opportunities for cooperation. So it's quite a sophisticated mechanism. I think nothing as sophisticated has ever been created before. Of course, when it's a very sophisticated mechanism, you wonder whether it's going to work well. Uh, and uh, and uh, no doubt the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Uh, but we have, I think, put, uh, you have, because it's member states um, adopting uh, this. Plus, I'm sorry, on PESCO, they are not only it's about projects, it's also about commitments. Commitment to invest more in defense and to, and, and to invest more in cooperative projects in defense. And, and to develop uh, uh, capabilities jointly and to deploy them jointly. So, so there is an element of political commitments in PESCO, which is, uh, I won't say as important 
as, um, as the projects themselves, but it is very important. And I know that both Kieran, I don't know if Kieran's still around. Yes, yes he is. He is. Uh, and Noel have uh, uh, been uh, helping us uh, to <laughs> develop in a harmonious uh, way uh, in, uh, in, in Brussels. Um, but we have it, we, we got there. So um, I think this is one of the elements that's missing in, in this, uh, in this um, box is the cooperation of um, uh, possible cooperation of third states in PESCO projects. And this is now being finalized. Um, and, uh, and I hope that we will find an agreement on this by the end of the year. Uh, uh, with main elements, uh, security uh, is the fact that a third state intervening in a project will it make Will it, will, it, uh, will it limit uh, or will endanger security of supply or limit possibilities of export of, of the goods that are produced? <laughs> and of course, that has to be ruled out. We will not want a third state if we're going to have problems of security of supply afterwards or limitations toward regarding exports. Or, um, or obviously, if the technology that is being produced it will be used against us because the state that we're inviting is not a, a state that is uh, sympathetic to the principles and objectives that we seek in foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the elements. And the other is the added value. So wh whoever is supporting a project has to bring added value, has to bring or investment or uh, know-how uh, to the project. So that's the PESCO part. And I'll leave here then the box of, of development of defense capability. If this works, as my, my former boss, and you mentioned him, um, uh, Herman van Rompuy used to say, uh, you know, you, you can bring a horse to the water, but you cannot force it to drink. Mm -hmm. and, and here we brought the horse to the water, and actually it's drinking. Um, you know, 34 projects have been already um, have been uh, agreed to. And, and the latest project, the latest batch of projects, the first one was done in a hurried manner because it was necessary to show that this was not just a paper exercise. But the last batch of project is starting to be industrially significant. And so I think we have hopes that the horse will drink and the horse will live uh, happily ever after. Um, so uh, that's uh, for defense capability development. Then we have within the toolbox that the European Union has, and it has a very broad toolbox uh, um, in order to tackle defense uh, challenges. And part of this toolbox is the crisis management operations that we have. And as you know, we have right now 16 operations um, fully deployed. Six of them are, are military, 10 of them are uh, civilian. And, um, uh, and uh, um, we have been improving the tools. And you mentioned, you mentioned, uh, you, you called the civilian CSDP the Cinderella, uh, or did you not? Uh, yeah, the civilian side, yes, uh, the Cinderella. The Cinderella, no, come on. It is, <laughs> it is a very important part of civilian CSDP, yes, and I think yes. I've acknowledged It was by the perception, I think. <laughs> I, I think um, it, it is widely acknowledged that civilian CSDP is a very important part of our crisis mm -hmm. management tools. And, and, um, uh, and they are delivering in very difficult circumstances, yes. mm -hmm. um, be it in, uh, in the Sahel or in Somalia or in uh, notably Sahel, but also may, one of the biggest operations that we've ever deployed has been the Kosovo one, with uh, at some point uh, close to 3,000 people uh, in, in that operation when we took over from UNMIC in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, um, but we have decided that we had to revamp civilian CSDP, and this is one of the big challenges that we have. One of the differences between civilian CSDP and military CSDP is that, okay, military are normally there for deployment. Civilian assets, uh, be it police officers, justice officials, uh, penitentiary, they're there for national needs. Uh, nations do not produce uh, civilian experts in order to send them to missions abroad. And, and this is one of the biggest challenges that, that we're confronting uh, in finding the right experts to uh, bring into uh, these operations. And part of our work is to convince um, the, and I think this is something we have to do collectively with member states have to uh, chip in, to convince their ministers of interior, of justice, that they need, that it is in their interest and that it's in the security interests of, of their own countries to send police officers abroad. They, will, they may have a greater impact at the end than if they stayed home. And so we have, and this is what the Civilian Compact is partly about. It is about member states committing to provide more civilian experts uh, to uh, the missions. And 
having enabling arrangements. And what we're discovering, I know, I think that uh, Ireland is very much at the forefront, and you've commissioned a study, which we're keen to, um, uh, to see. Uh, we're a comparative study of the mechanisms in different member states to provide um, civilian experts to, um, to civilian, uh, experts to civilian missions. And some countries don't have arrangements to do this, actually. So, ah. which makes it obviously even difficult. Many countries don't acknowledge the worth of the contribution of the civilian uh, person serving uh, abroad uh, in, in the curriculum of this person. So it's not even acknowledged that, that mm -hmm. what this person has done in this last two or three years has been a service to his uh, country. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many things that can be done. Of course, there are then there are specific trainings that may be useful. And I think if we look at the, at the years ahead of us, Probably we need to um, train in languages, and I would say, you know, let's invest a bit more in French and, and Arabic training. Uh, if I had to, um, does, you don't need really a, a, a crystal ball to, to say that. That's what, where we will be uh, in the coming years. Uh, so, uh, again, Civilian Compact is aimed at, uh, at um, facilitating and at, at member states committing to, to provide these experts to look into their own arrangements, internal arrangements, and legislation to make this possible. It's also about increased responsiveness, and we've committed collectively to be able to deploy a 200-man, a man or woman, <laughs> persons, um, mission, civilian mission in 30 days. And it may sound not that big, uh, but it is a lot. And, and the kind of uh, infrastructure and logistics that you need to put 200 persons in, in a safety, safe environment uh, very far away from um, our borders is, is quite a feat. So, there are a number of, of issues. We will, we will, we're developing an action plan. Member states have to develop, I mean, collectively in the EU, but member states will have to develop national implementation plans to, to deliver these, these kind of experts. So again, very important move on, on civilian, and I applaud the support and the, and the, and the intellectual input uh, that our Irish colleagues have brought into this exercise. Um, but then we've also worked on something in which you've been a bit more remiss, uh, which is <laughs> the military planning and conduct capability. Um, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the planning capability and the uh, operational capability for military missions. And we had, al we had already agreed to take this uh, a step forward uh, in, uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, having a capacity that would allow the EU to have command and control over non-executive uh, military missions, training missions uh, essentially, um, but it could be other kind of uh, monitoring missions, but these are training. The ones that we have in Somalia and in, in, in Central African Republic and in uh, uh, Niger, uh, sorry, in uh, Mali. Um, and now we have, we have taken a, an important step to have that capacity also being capable of even uh, exercising planning and conduct capability for an executive type of operations, up to 2,500 persons um, strong, which is battle group um, size. And, and, and for that, we would increase this. Um, to, it is all, it's all relatively modest. Huh? Um, the, the total number of staff of this entity would be 60, up from 24 that we, or 25 that we currently have, so 35 plus. <laughs> plus an augmenti uh, capability up to 95 uh, augmentees if a, an executive uh, operation were to be launched under such a chain of command. So this is another, we have different arrangements for, for uh, operation command and control, uh, national headquarters that are put at the disposal of the European Union, but this, having it within the European Union, would give greater level of readiness because these people would be trained and, and, and ready to, to launch uh, work at, at a go. And, and then it will give also greater control to member states um, because the operation commander will be in Brussels, will be responding to the political control and the strategic direction of the PSC, um, in, as we all do, huh? no, don't we, uh, Noel? Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and we were really at the disposal of, of, the, of the PSC anytime um, uh, the PSC requests, not at headquarters, which are in other parts of Europe, where the control that is exercised on the Operation Commander is a bit more remote, uh, I'd say, um, because of the nature of, of mm -hmm. the machine itself. So that's an important step as well, the MPCC. Um, another important, I will, um, I know, I don't know if I'm, I'm being a bit too long, I should... Uh, 
maybe another few minutes. I think you're under time constraints, Pedro, so maybe another five minutes. Okay, sorry. another five minutes, and then we go for a question and answer? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then the European Peace Facility. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most important initiatives uh, that uh, we have put on the table. It is um, an, an off-budget uh, fund um, which would finance uh, the uh, CSDP, the crisis management, military crisis management operations that the European Union itself would launch. Operations, military operations launched by partners, uh, be it um, groups of partners, uh, AMISOM, for example, in Somalia, as we are currently financing, or the joint force of the G5, or even we could finance through this if there's a transition from AMISOM to Somali National Armed Forces, we would be able to finance Somali National Armed Forces. Oh. Um, and finally, equipping. Uh, one of the big thing problems that we've had in the last uh, um, uh, years has been the equipment of the uh, military we trained. And, and this has led to uh, situations even where, because we were not being able to, um, to um, um, equip the military we were training in, in Central African Republic, we've had now, for example, the Russians providing weapons uh, in the Central African Republic mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and developing their relations uh, there. So we do need to, uh, to have a mechanism that will allow us not only to train, um, the forces that uh, that we're supporting in order to in a crisis management context. This is not cooperation and not training forces for let's say uh, military adventures abroad. This is training forces in the context of a stabilization effort mm -hmm. and of a crisis management effort. Because we all know, and the experience of Iraq and Afghanistan are very clear in this respect, that. It is not through executive operations normally that you are successful. You become at the end the foreigner and a bit the enemy or can be portrayed as such, even if you're trying to help the populations, but you can easily be portrayed as, let's say, a foreign, uh, you are a foreign presence and, and that always has a connotation. So the best way to stabilize and to address crisis is by empowering um, the uh, local, uh, let's say, um, legitimate actors to regain control over territory. And this is what we're trying to do uh, in Mali, notably. We're trying to strengthen capabilities of other Sahel countries. We're trying to help the Somali National Army um, to, again, uh, end these in, in, in Somalian armed forces beyond Mogadishu, also in the federal states, to take over control of their country and, and security of their country. And all this, of course, within UN uh, mandates and context and, and in the context of, um, as I say, stabilization and crisis management efforts. And so this facility, which is really now being discussed, and I hope um, that, uh, um, that it will be uh, finally uh, approved um, next year, uh, will make um, a, a huge difference in our capacity to act. And then very quickly, just to mention, we know that we cannot solve all the problems on our own. So everything that we've done, we do it in, in, with a view to working with partners. Yes, we have to be capable of responding on our own, and, and this is what we call strategic autonomy, but we know that in most cases we need to work uh, with others. And here we've been enhancing our relationship with the United Nations. We're, we're the major partner of the United Nations in crisis management. And practically all our operations are linked and, uh, to support the United Nations. We have developed further our relations with the African Union, and we have now a memorandum of understanding for exchanges and, and, and cooperation on, on a yearly basis at strategic, political, strategic level with the African Union. And we've been cooperating with them for ages, but now we've formalized more the relationship. And we have, in the last uh, uh, three years, also enhanced the cooperation with NATO uh, considerably. Uh, with 74 joint actions. We have actually a system, a constant system of engagement that goes from capability development and all the capabilities that we pr may produce in defense will be member states' capabilities, which means also the disposal of NATO uh, for those member states that are also NATO allies. Um, but also working on cyber, on hybrid, uh, on, um, on operations themselves and cooperating uh, in, in operations, be it on sea, uh, at sea or, 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 or inland. So that has been also a very important part of our work. I was, I think I don't have time um, to refer more specifically to our operations, maybe just to say it has shifted when we launched CSDP, Security and Defense Policy, in the late uh, 90s, early 2000s rather. Western Balkans 
was the name of the game. And most of the first operations were there in the Western Balkans, were taking over from the UN, even taking over from NATO in, uh, in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Now, uh, we are m mostly engaged in Africa. Uh, we're still engaged in the Western Balkans, and that's uh, something worth discussing. But most of the operational action will be, I think, in the foreseeable future in, um, in uh, Africa, and notably around what one could term the security belt, which uh, for us, which goes from Mauritania to Somalia, mm -hmm. the Sahelian uh, security belt. If we are capable of assisting these countries in, in controlling their borders, in developing their economies, in increasing their uh, quality of their governance, um, Europea, Europe will be much more a secure place, and this will be. And the last point is maritime operations. I referred to them. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was over lunch. But yes. um, uh, and the, the, the key strategic importance of Operation Sophia in the Central Mediterranean, Operation Atalanta in uh, off the coast of Somalia, not only on the basis of their current mandates, but in my view as well as real maritime security operations that Europe will need for many years to come. So. A lot of work, um, uh, much has been done, but much more needs to be done. We know that uh, we need others and we need to work with others. Uh, the European Union is a multilateralist um, partner. It, it's in its essence multilateral and it believes in multilateralism. It believes that the way to address problems is through uh, cooperation and not confrontation. We have to have means to engage and, and to face uh, the challenges that are confronting us. And this is what we've been trying to uh, develop in the last years, very much also in the wake of the global strategy that I should have mentioned at the early, at the beginning, uh, that was uh, um, presented by the High Representative in June 2016. So with this, I, I will stop and, uh, and very much eager to engage in a dialogue with you. And well, many thanks again. Thank you very much.